Mark Rader. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, really, I'm really encouraged uh, by how many of you are here. Uh, just a really exciting opportunity for us uh, to gather tonight. Just before I begin, though, I want to say a couple thank yous. First of all, to Richard and his staff uh, from Heller's, Helen's Catering. I think you could agree that was a great meal. Thank you. Also want to uh, thank Karen Watkins, who is at table four. Yeah. She's over there. Well done, Karen. Uh, Karen uh, just, uh, has just uh, taken up the office manager's role, and she said, what sort of events are there? I said, oh, you know, like morning teas and stuff. And then when she started, I said, oh, we're also having a vision dinner. Uh, and then all of you decided to come, which was great, but not so much. Uh, so, you know, don't listen to what I say. Uh, John Delizio, who's not here tonight, is our operations manager. He's also done a lot of work in this. Uh, Sheena Hine and Jackie Martin did heaps on, like, the little place settings and setting up the tables and making it pretty. So thank you. Uh, Bev Sparks and Stephen Hatton, our, our office volunteers, did a whole bunch of work for this as well. And I'd like to thank Jared as well for his work tonight. Thank you. Um, which is fantastic. Well, in the time remaining, I'd like to share with you uh, what I believe the Lord is leading us to as a church uh, and a little bit about how you can be involved uh, as we move forward. But I need to start with a little bit of background uh, just to bring you up to speed. So when I was appointed to this role as senior pastor at the end of 2014, about 18 months ago now, I was doing some reading on life cycles of congregations. And uh, the principle of the life cycles of congregations is pretty simple. Uh, organizations, much like any other organism, uh, ends up having its own life cycle. Uh, and there are particular stages of each organization. And a fellow named Marty Saarinen of the Alban Institute had done some study in the life cycles of congregations and had suggested that there were four genes that were at work uh, when you talked about a particular organization or church. And they were evident in varying degrees as a church grew and developed and whatnot. So what you have up behind me is the kind of the basic life cycle. The horizontal dotted line is about sustainability, uh, and uh, the upright line is about vitality. Now that's kind of how this works. So if you think about a church that's just in the birth process, I actually want to bring up those four genes. Sorry, Mark. Uh, you've got four genes, energy, inclusion, programs, and administration. Uh, energy is all about vision, it's about a uh, sense of hope and potency and potential. Inclusion is about the relationships and how many people are involved and have bought into uh, this new endeavor. Programs are just the ministries and activities of a church and administration is, well, administration to make sure all that stuff happens. So when a church is birthed, you have these four genes in a particular, shall we say, order. So you start with a lot of energy when a church gets birthed. Uh, lots of people are excited. You get a small group of people. They're all saying, let's, let's, do, let's plant a church, let's start a ministry, whatever it might be. Lots of energy. You don't have a lot of people, though, who are included, and so the letter I is small, and there are not any programs because, well, you don't have enough people, and you're not really sure what you're doing yet. You're just really excited about it. So you don't have any programs, and the administration is also quite low. When you move into the next stage of infancy, you then have high energy, uh, but you also have more people involved. You still don't have very many programs. You don't really have any administration yet either. You just have a bunch of people that are super excited. You know, where are we going? I don't know. You want to come along? Yes. And off you trump. Uh, when you move into uh, then childhood, you have, a, again, a slightly different connection. Lots of energy. Uh, you start to have lots of inclusion. You have some programs to go with the administration. And then you pass over the line of sustainability and actually become a vital church that actually, at that point in time, has, uh, it becomes the adolescent stage, lots of energy. Inclusion goes down a little bit at this point because for the first time you don't need everybody to do everything. You finally have enough people that you don't need everyone to be doing everything all the time. Programs increase, the administration gets, uh, is still a little bit low. When you reach adulthood, in terms of a church life cycle, you kind of hit, hit, hit the big time. Everything's happening. Lots of people are involved, there's lots of energy, programs are up and running, you finally got the administrative grunt that you need to kind of get things moving. And then the church begins, in, in terms of its life cycle, begins to move into decline. So you have maturity. And when a church enters into maturity, the first thing to go, shall we say, is energy. 
the energy decreases a little bit. Still heaps of people involved, lots of things happening, lots of administration, but there's not quite the same sense of vision. And as the church moves through the life cycle into um, uh, the empty nest, retirement, old age, and then finally death, which is a little bit morbid, I must admit, <clears throat> what you end up with is the energy goes down, the programs die out because there's no energy for it anymore, and then when you get below the line of sustainability again, no, no energy, people aren't really in involved, but there are still a handful of programs that the kind of the core who are left over continue to do, and they still have all the administration that they developed in adulthood. When you finally get to the death stage of a church, there's just administration. Uh, for some of us, that sounds about right uh, when it comes right down to it. So I was doing some reading on this at the time, and uh, in between the staff and then some of the leaders who gathered at the start of 2015, the general consensus was that as a church, we had entered into the, the stage of maturity, that we had just begun the kind of the first stages of decline. Uh, and uh, the reason that we kind of came to that conclusion was largely based on the fact that we felt there was a loss of energy about the place. Now, there's still lots of stuff going on, lots of activities, lots of programs, all those sorts of things. But it had been a while since we'd done something really creative and, and kind of interesting. We just kind of chugged out the same things all the time. Uh, it was hard to find people to be involved in ministry. Now, that's something that always happens, but it was, well, it was different at that point. There's a whole bunch of stuff that contributed to that. Now, the good news is, when you're talking about an organization, an organization can renew itself. Um, a tree, for instance, can't just immediately go back to being younger. Uh, it's not the way it works. But an organization can renew itself. And that process can often take, depending on kind of the stage of decline, can take between 6 and 18 months. So we had a little bit of work uh, to do before anything kind of began to turn around. Well... In the last few months, I feel that there has been a renewed sense of energy about the place. I don't know if you've felt it, uh, but I certainly have. Uh, last year, people would come up to me and say, you know, there's a good vibe about the place. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that sounds good. Uh, and I suppose vibes are helpful, but we're looking for E, not V. Uh, and uh, so I was like, all right, that's fine. But this year, in the last few months, I feel that there's something's happened. And I feel that there's a renewed sense of energy about the place. I think there's a number of, of kind of clues for me. Um, the response of people to prayer in our services has just been quite extraordinary. I think it's done a great deal for us in terms of our sense of community and what it means for us to be the family of God. Uh, the response to the mission statement uh, was, um, was amazing. I was so encouraged by how people responded to that and the sorts of things that I've been hearing from people. Um, I've had heaps of conversations with people who have now, are now saying to me, we're in. What can we do? Uh, and that wasn't happening 18 months ago. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we say we're going to have a dinner for $25 that you have to pay for, and then I'm going to talk about some stuff, and 150 people show up. That sounds like energy to me. Uh, and so I'm very encouraged by that. And I think there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, our themes of new horizons and going deeper has meant that it's kind of been kept the forefront of our kind of our consciousness and we've been preaching about it we've been talking about it we've been thinking and praying about it I think that some of the decisions that we've made as a congregation and as a community have been pretty important in that so our decision to broadcast uh, through the Australian Christian Channel that we made last year I, like I was just I was so wrapped by that whole process that we went through it was a long and tedious process but I felt that we made a decision which I thought was outstanding uh, staff appointments. Uh, there's been a lot of change in the staff, but that brings a certain degree of freshness, even if it is, you know, English freshness. Uh, you know, it's just been really, really good. Uh, but I think ultimately it's the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in response to the prayers of God's people. I mean, I've been praying that God would pour out His Spirit on us, that there'd be a fresh sense of vision, that we would become a people of prayer, that that we would become a warmer and more robust community of faith. These are things that I've been praying about. I know that many of you have been praying as well. And so I don't think it's an accident that, as it so happens, 6, 8, 10, 12 months after we notice that there's a loss of energy, that all of a sudden there's some energy about the place. But it begins to beg the question, at least for me, where are we going to direct and focus that energy? It's all well and good to say, well, we've got some. Now what are we going to do with it? Uh, what are we going to do as a body here, as a community of faith? 
And I think the obvious place for us to start, of course, is with the mission statement. Uh, I like the mission statement uh, because not only does it fit in a nice little fridge magnet, but it's big. Like, it's big. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of creative energy and engagement and thought and people and skills and gifts to think about how we unpack that and then bed that down in, into our lives so it gets off of our fridges uh, and into our lives. That's a big, big project for us. I'm really excited about it. There are also, of course, the current ministries that we have. There's lots of stuff that we do as a church that could really use an infusion of energy, uh, some fresh thinking, some new ways of doing things, some new ways of engaging, different ways to engage with our community. Uh, or there are other things that, uh, that we don't even know about yet. You know, Brett Davis was here just a couple of weeks ago for May Mission Month, and he talked about how 40 years ago he had this kind of crazy idea about starting a surfing ministry and look where it's gone and it, it came out of here well where's the next christian surfers and and are we ready are we ready for it uh, do we have the energy and the focus to actually get that sort of a thing off the ground well these are the sorts of things that i'm thinking about but there is a bit of a kink in the hose for us i think you know when you're watering the lawn and you move the hose and all of a sudden the water dies down and you do this, and, you know, right? Uh, right? Yeah, and then it's, there's a kink in the hose, and you're not getting the same amount of pressure out. For us, I think it all wraps, it comes down to this question that we ask in our annual church survey. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. We ask this question. Do you feel GBC encourages people to use their gifts and skills? We give you four options. Yes, a great deal. Yes, sometimes, a little, or not at all. In 2015, 48% of those who completed that survey said, yes, a great deal. At one level, that's kind of encouraging. But it means that more than half of those who filled it out said, sometimes, a little, or not at all. And when you compare that to, say, 2010, over the last several years that we've been doing the, asking that same question, this is the worst result we've ever had. Uh, it was as high as 63% in 2012 uh, and as low as 49, and we've managed to dip beneath that. That's troubling to me. <laughs> you know, and when this happened in 2010, when we first had this come to light, uh, I mean, there's a bit of soul searching as a leadership. Like, what is it that, uh, how have we contributed to this? Because we certainly don't preach that. We don't stand up and say, if you have gifts and skills, take them elsewhere, thank you very much. We have no need for them. So what's happened? And what we've realized, uh, I think in particular over the last little while, is that this is not so much primarily a communication problem as it is a structural problem. And that structural problem, and I've talked a bit about this before, actually communicates that we don't need your gifts and your skills. Uh, and let me illustrate what this actually kind of looks like. I'm going to use Angelo's role before he went part-time. Please do not take this as any, in any sense as a criticism of Angelo at all. It's just kind of convenient to be able to describe his ministry. So when Angelo was on staff full-time, uh, our emphasis, and this has been our emphasis for a long time, has been on building teams. So we wanted our staff, our key staff, to be building teams of people. And so Angelo built teams. He built a team that was involved in stewarding, for instance. Uh, he built a team that was involved in welcoming. He built a team around pastoral care and for those who were involved uh, not only in life groups but also in membership. He did exactly what we wanted him to do. He built teams. The problem, however, and you can probably figure this out already, is that those teams grew too big. And so you had 80, 90, 100 different people all kind of reporting to Angelo. And so any problem fell to Angelo to solve. Any gap fell to Angelo to fill. Any decision fell to Angelo to make and make sure it was communicated, which meant that while he had built teams, they couldn't grow anymore. We actually had three really significant implications of this. First of all, most of the responsibility fell to the staff, in this case, Angelo. Most of the responsibility to solve problems, to fill gaps, to make decisions fell to him. Okay, he had some key people who were involved in each of those teams, but the problem was that there wasn't a lot of scope for them. Now, those roles are limited both in scope and responsibility. Uh, a team member is, well, a team member. 
There was no kind of leadership. There was no responsibility. There was no authority. There was no clear outcomes. This is the problem that they ended up facing. So not only did all these responsibilities fall to them, but you also had volunteer roles that were limited in scope and responsibility, which meant essentially that when we were offering people an opportunity to serve, it was not very stretching. Now, some of the roles that we have are fairly stretching and fairly involved, but too many of them were, well, they just weren't. We have a church of incredible capacity, people with incredible skills, incredible gifts, and we were asking them to do really little things. And this became part of our dilemma. And the staff then, finally, were then too busy to develop the ministries or kind of do anything about a new initiative. I can't tell you how many times people would say, what about this? And a part of me would say, yes, that's fantastic. I have no idea how we're going to do that. This became part of our dilemma. And I think that's these, this structure that then communicates that we don't need your gifts and abilities. We don't have any scope for you to use your gifts and abilities. We don't have any real uh, structure to actually allow you to flourish and lead and serve and really build the kingdom of God here. And so what we we're hoping will be part of the solution to this is actually to change this up just a little bit. And instead of having our staff, again, if I can still use Angelo as an example, instead of having them build teams, we want them to begin releasing leaders. So what we want to be trying to find is volunteer team leaders. Now, here's the thing that will happen if we, can, if we can do this. If you have volunteer team leaders who then oversee each of those groups, for instance, you end up with individuals who have real authority and real responsibility to, to lead groups. Instead of having uh, just uh, kind of one person who has 100 people reporting to them, you have groups of 20 reporting to an individual. That's still too many, by the way, but it's a start. You have team leaders who then share the responsibility with the staff, which I think is incredible. I think second of all, you would then have real volunteer leadership roles that have real scope and real responsibility, where some of you can actually step in and do some really amazing stuff. And it also then increases our capacity to develop and start new ministries. And the more that we've been thinking about this as a staff, the more that we've been reflecting on the significance of this sort of shift, the more we are convinced that this needs to happen. This needs to happen. Uh, it has to be what takes place next. So for example, let me give you a bit of an outline of what this might look like in Mark Coleman's current role. Uh, you know that uh, he is the associate pastor for welcoming and integration, which includes these four areas, stewards, welcomers, life groups, and, and membership. Let's, for the moment, say this is what we're hoping to do. Actual structure and titles may differ, so don't get cranky about this time. Right? So what we're trying to do, what we're hoping to do, is to appoint a stewarding team leader, or several of them, uh, welcoming team leaders. Uh, life group coordinators, membership coordinators, people who can lead groups. And Mark's task is not so much to build teams anymore. His task is to release leaders, to, to not be the one to provide service, but the one who provides support. You might notice that uh, pastoral care is missing on this. Don't fret. It's here. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is developing a volunteer ministry that will provide pastoral care. Uh, our, our mechanism for the last 11 years has been tell Angelo. That's our mechanism for pastoral care, which is fine until he retires. Um, and it actually wasn't fine because we're trying to get a church of eight to 900 people to relate to one person for pastoral care. That's not a, a sustainable model. And so what we're hoping to do is to provide someone who will lead groups of teams who will then provide pastoral care for our church, allowing the body of Christ to care for the body of Christ, to utilize the gifts and skills and passions that are latent in our community and allowing them to get at it. 
We might even, if we kind of get really kind of crazy, is move one step further with, say, for instance, stewards. And instead of just having stewards and a team leader, actually have a section leader who oversees several stewarding team leaders. How outrageous would that be? Uh, and uh, then the sky's the limit for how wonderful our structural program might look. <clears throat> So here's the vision that I would like to cast tonight. Here's the thing that I would like you to walk away with. I think there are two things that I would love us to direct our energy to as a community of faith. The first of them is a leadership structure uh, and culture that releases gifted volunteers to lead GBC. In order that as a church we might more faithfully steward the resources the Lord has given us as we seek to complete our mission statement. It's a bit wordy, uh, I realize, but I didn't want to leave any of the bits out. But ultimately, I would, like, I would love our leadership uh, uh, culture to no longer be about building teams, but about releasing leaders. And that's going to take a pretty big shift, both on our part as a staff, but also on our part as a community of faith. It means we're going to have to talk differently about this sort of stuff. I was talking to my mentor in Melbourne a bit about this, and, uh, and we were just chatting a bit about it. And he said one of the things that he's uh, learning to do is to not have an opinion about everything. If he's actually allowing people to lead, if he's releasing leaders, then he's got to stop having an opinion about everything. He's got to let them lead. And so I've been practicing not having an opinion, and it's not going very well at all. <laughs> and it's just there's some structural practices and habits that we have that just are going to get in the way of this. But I think to, to go alongside a leadership culture that releases leaders, we then also need a leadership structure that is sustainable, and scalable and facilitates our participation in the ministry opportunities the Lord provides. I would hate to think that we might miss the next Christian surfers because our leadership structure is too flat. But right now, our ministry structure is not sustainable. Uh, all of our staff are very busy, and busyness is good. You don't want people bored, but they're just busy, and they're so busy in ministry, they can't do anything on ministry. They can't be thinking strategically. They can't be releasing leaders, and that's problematic. It's not scalable. If we doubled in size, our only response is to hire more people, which is one way to do it, but I'd love to think that we could actually harness the skills and abilities of this group and others as well. And if we can get this right, if we, can, if we can get this right, I believe that this will become our legacy for the next generation of believers here. That's how important I think this is. This is not just about leadership. This is about our legacy. Because if we get this right, we will unlock the capacity of this church. I think for a long time now, and we've had some reflections on this as leadership over a number of years, we're kind of like a bit of a sports car that's stuck in second. It's going pretty quick in second, but boy, if you could get that puppy in the fifth, you'd really be moving. But we're a church of so much resource, so much experience, so many skills, so much ability, and we're just not tapping into it. There's a kink in the hose, and it's this. I read a book on teams earlier this year, and one of the, the quotes that stuck with me, and one individual who leads a fairly large church in the United States he said, I do not lead my church. He said, I lead the people who lead my church. And I thought, that's it. We need to be people who aren't leading the church, but who are leading the people who are leading the church. We want to release the potential that we have here, increase our capacity, move from service to support. And if we can do this, I do believe it will make an enormous difference uh, to the future of Gaimia Baptist Church. You know, personally, this is pretty important to me. I'm pretty busy right now. Busyness is good. I'm really enjoying my role. I love it. It's all good. But I'd like to be busy about doing the things that are most important. And right now, I suspect I'm spending a lot of time being busy on things that you could do. And this isn't about you helping me get my work done. It's about me releasing you to do the work that God wants you to do so that I can be about the stuff that God wants me to be about. I've come to the realization over the last several months that the busyness that I'm currently in is ultimately sinful. So this isn't about leadership. This isn't about a restructure for the sake of a restructure. I believe that I'm not actually using the resources God has given me the way I ought to. Now, I don't wake up feeling condemned and guilty every morning. That, it's not like that. But it's, uh, this is important to me. I, I want to I get this right so that I can release you and then I can be released 
to be doing the things that God wants me to be about. And if we can all be doing this together, look out. And I think that's what I would love for you to be involved with us. So in terms of our first steps to getting there, there's a handful of things that we're working on. I wanted to tell you a bit about them. I don't want to bore you with the details because details are boring, but let me give you some of them nonetheless. We want to try to complete the back-end processes. So if we're going to release leaders into ministry, we need to have role descriptions and interview processes and application forms and all that kind of back-end grunt. That's going to take us a little bit of time to work out. I've had a number of you say, we're in, how can we help? And I've said to you, just give me a little time. I will come back to you. Uh, we need to get some of this stuff right so that if you want to step into ministry, you have a clear idea about what you're stepping into. That you have a clear idea about the sort of support that we will seek to offer about your authority and responsibility and all of those sorts of things. Then we want to roll that out in a couple of areas. We want to roll that out in GBC Cares, uh, which we're hoping will happen probably in, in early July if we can. We've had a small group of people who have been meeting about that a couple of times already to try to get that right. And then also in worship ministry. That's the other kind of ministry that will get the, uh, the restructured treatment right off the bat. And then we'll just kind of roll through everything else that we do as a church and seek to release people in those areas. And then we want to make some changes to how we do things that reflect the culture that we actually want to cultivate. So one of the, I suppose, most significant, or one of the first things that we'll be doing at any rate, is that we're going to be shifting our staff meetings from staff meetings to leadership team meetings. And instead of holding them once every six weeks on a Monday afternoon when the staff are available, we're going to hold them on a Monday night when everyone's theoretically available. Uh, so if you end up being in one of these key volunteer roles, one of the expectations will be that you'll be at our leadership team meetings. So instead of there being 10 or 11 or 12 of us, there might be 20 or 30 of us. And we'll be talking vision, and we'll be talking about the mission, and we'll be talking about how we get there, and we'll be encouraging one another and praying and receiving training, and I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to start that in July. Uh, that's when that's going to happen, uh, and I hope that it won't just be the staff by then. I'm hoping that there'll be a handful of you uh, and others who will be there participating in that as key volunteer leaders to release the capacity of the church. So how can you get involved? Well, I'm going to get a couple of the staff to hand these commitment cards out. If I can get them to wander forward, Ryan and Pete, and look at this. They didn't even know they were doing it, just willing to serve. <laughs> Notice how all the responsibility falls on the staff. All right. Basically, what we have here is a commitment card. Yeah, just uh, pass, pass them out. There's, ta there's pencils on the tables there. Uh, this is a commitment card, and we're asking you to commit to two things. First of all, at the very, very least, will you commit to pray? Um, I do not believe that this is an accident, that there's a renewed sense of energy about the place. I believe that God's in this. And so I would really love for you to continue to pray and continue to pray that we'd get this right. So it says there just a handful of things that you might want to think about as you pray, that we'd honor God as we seek to steward his resources, that God would raise up the right people for the right positions, and that this would release people and resources for the flourishing of ministries both here and beyond. But there's also a section at the bottom, a little tear-off section at the bottom, and that asks if you would like to take the next step to participate in the formation of this thing. And if you give us your name and your email address, then here's what's going to happen. In about two weeks time you're gonna get a web form and it's gonna be largely speaking a relatively generic application form of sorts it's for those of you who are currently in ministry and it's currently for those of you who may not be serving for those of you who are in ministry it's gonna ask a few questions such as are we actually using you to your capacity are you bored stiff in the things that we're asking you to do would you like to do more or are you maxed out is there some training that you would need that would help you flourish as a leader? Those sorts of questions. And for those of you who may not be in ministry, and for those of you who are, we want to be asking questions about how has God used you in the past? What sorts of experiences have you had where God's really kind of moved through you, where you've been a conduit of the Spirit of God to build people up? What are the sorts of things that you're passionate about and areas in which you would like to serve? Uh, and that will be kind of our generic form out of which we will then be contacting you when we think that there might possibly be a key leadership position that might fit someone like you. Uh, so there's no kind of, there's no commitment beyond saying, yes, I'd like to take the next step. 
Uh, signing up doesn't mean that you must automatically accept whatever job we can come up with for you. It simply means that when we have a role that we think might fit you, we'll ask you if you'd like to be involved. And at that point, you can prayerfully consider it. You can say no, you can say yes, and we'll see what God does.